It's a good day to be in the house of God. Amen. You love the Lord? <clears throat> Today, <clears throat> I'm, I'm preaching a message that I never intended to preach here this morning. I, I was working on another message, and the Holy Spirit changed it, probably because he knew you'd be here. <clears throat> I don't know who this is for, other than myself and anyone else who may... Uh, I'll tell you, if this doesn't apply to you today, file it away, you're going to need it. It's entitled, When You Come to the End of Yourself. When You Come to the End of Yourself. Would you go to Psalm 38, please? Psalm 38. Praise the Lord. Let's begin to read uh, at verse, we'll start uh, verse 6. David is speaking. Now let's start verse uh, 6. I am troubled. I'm bowed down greatly. I go mourning all the day long. Verse 8. I am feeble and sore broken. I've roared by reason of the disquietness of my heart. Verse 10, my heart panteth, my strength faileth me. As for the light of mine eyes, it is also gone from me. Verse 13, but I as a deaf man heard not, and I was a, as a dumb man that openeth not his mouth. Verse 14, thus I was as a man that heareth not, and his mouth are no reproofs. When you come to the end of yourself, Heavenly Father, I don't question why you put this on my heart today. I intended to go another direction, but you put me in this direction for some reason known only to yourself, but I obey you, Holy Spirit. There are people here in the annex listening to me, people in the choir, people in the main auditorium, wherever it may be, that are going through the experience that we're going to describe this morning, and they need to hear the word of the living God, how to get out of this condition. Lord, we pray for a miracle of hearing. Give us a hearing ear to hear what the Holy Spirit has to say. God, anoint my lips, anoint the word that comes from my heart and mouth, sanctify it, and let it be life-changing to all of us, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now here in Psalm 38, David has come to the end of himself. Godly, righteous man who feels drained of all human strength, and he's troubled that he can't understand how a man that's so hungry for God could be going through such a, a low period of total discouragement. And you're listening to a man in this chapter who's literally come to the end of himself. He's come to the Lord in prayer. He's, he's bringing this, this thing that he's going through to the Lord because he can't understand it. He's saying to God, I'm really come to the end of my rope. I'm at wit's end, and I don't know why it's happening. I don't know how it happened. He's trying to figure out why he's so discouraged, and he feels so empty. He's sore broken in mind and spirit, and he can't put his finger on the cause. Amazingly, he tells the Lord so in so many words, Lord, I've been a foolish man. Have all my past sins, my past foolishness, left me wounded and beyond hope? And David seems to be slumped over in, in the presence of the Lord in prayer. He's just slumped over in despair, feeling like a failure uh, about all the foolish things he's done in his life in the past, every wicked thing that he's done, the wounds he's inflicted on himself and others around him. And he, he, he is so low, he figures the Lord's chastening him, that somehow the wrath of God has been kindled against him. He said, in other words, you, you must be whipping me, Lord. That's the only thing I can figure out. He says, Lord, you're shooting your arrows of anger into my heart. I feel your anger toward me. I have no peace. I have no rest. Lord, my sins are over my head in verse 2 to 4. My sins are a burden I can no longer carry. This is a godly, holy man speaking. Now, before I go a step further, let me tell you, he's not only describing his own condition, he's, con he's describing a condition that happens to very godly people. 
very godly, devout people who love God with all their hearts, there will come a time when there is a sudden, unexpected experience in your life of absolute, total discouragement. You don't know how it happened, where it came from. It's suddenly there. And this is a situation that David's in. Now, David can't understand this, but he's under a satanic attack. This is an absolute spirit. The spirit of discouragement is the devil's number one most potent weapon against godly people, against the elect. A spirit of discouragement it has nothing to do with the flesh. It's not something you bring upon yourself. Of course, there are people who bring discouragement on themselves because of sin. Uh, there are others because of rebellion and pride and all of these things, certainly. But this is not the case with David. It's not the case with many of us here who love the Lord passionately. But you find yourself overwhelmed at times with a sense of absolute uh, frailty, the absolute end of your endurance and strength to go on. This is what David is speaking about. And the Bible makes it very clear that Satan gets an advantage over us when we're ignorant of his methods and of his devices. He gets an advantage. He, he wants you to get so discouraged, so down, he wants you to believe it's a result if you're not having lived up to God's holy standards. He's, he's trying to make you feel and believe that you have brought this on yourself rather than the fact that he has put it upon you as a cloud. It's come from outside of you. It's something that is demonic. It's something that is from the pits and the bowels of hell. And if you understand that, you take away the advantage of Satan. Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. It's a satanic weapon of shooting an arrow into your heart out of his own quiver. He wants you to get so low and so down on yourself that you more or less want to throw in the towel and say to yourself, my sins are over my head. I don't understand my besetting sins. I don't know and understand the battles I go through. I don't understand that why after seeking God and pouring my heart out, it has to be so hard and difficult. Now, if I haven't come to you yet, it'll happen here shortly. Now, let's go on now, hearing David's heart cry while he's under this attack of discouragement. Now, listen to me, please. You've got to understand that if you are walking in repentance, you love God passionately, you love the Lord Jesus, you're not living in open sin, you're in a repentant spirit, and you're in the Word of God, you love the house of God, you are not living in sin, and yet you find yourself at the end of your rope. You find yourself in total discouragement, feeling unworthy, like you're not accomplishing anything in life. And suddenly it's there. You can wake up one morning and it's there. You go to sleep one night, you feel good, everything is all right. And you can't put a finger on the reason you're not in some kind of crisis. Nobody has hurt you, but there it is. And this is what David is describing. He said, there is a disquietness in my heart, O God. There's a feebleness that's gripped me. I don't know why, but I'm troubled. There's a deep mourning in me that I can't describe. Now, he suddenly feels like he's lost sense of direction. And he, he, he's in prayer. He's coming to God. He said, I, 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 and really, if you study the 38th chapter here and a few of the other chapters surrounding this, you, you'll find that David is feeling that he's not accomplished anything in his life. Folks, I, I tell you what, I, I have been there, done that, <laughs> where I can come home from a great meeting where many, I've been in crusades over my lifetime where literally thousands have been saved in mass crusades and I just finished writing a book and, and uh, so many, many things happen and I'll go home and then on a Monday it'll hit me and I'll walk around and I'll say, I'm not doing anything. I just don't feel I'm accomplishing anything. That's, that, that spirit of the enemy that comes, and usually comes right after you have sought the Lord with all of your heart and been closest to him. He said, my strength is failing me. As for the light of my eyes, it's also gone from me. 
my my vision of the Lord, my walk with God, uh, the revelation is not there. I'm not seeing, I'm not feeling, I'm not reaching what I want to reach. There's something out there I'm not touching. My strength is failing in the light of mine eyes. It's also gone from me. He's so discouraged. He's so confused. He can't even lift up his hand to God. You know, I, I, I've, I taught under the, uh, the message of the covenant that the Lord said, I will take you by the hand. And David's in play. He can't even reach up his hand. He can't even reach out to the Lord. He's saying, I have nothing left in me. I am drained. I, I have nothing to give to people anymore. I have nothing. Listen to him. He said, but as a deaf man, as a dumb man that openeth not his mouth, thus was a man that heareth not and whose mouth are no reproofs. And in the Hebrews, a man who has no more answers, no more arguments left. I, I, he said, I, I've tried to do my best. I've tried to give answers for people who ask. I've tried to be an answer man. I've tried everything, but I've got no more answers. I have nothing more to say to anybody. I am so drained. I'm so empty. I have nothing to give to people. He's loving God passionately. It's not anything to do with his love for God. It has nothing to do with ever thinking of walking out on God. Not at all. But he's not understanding why a holy man who's seeking God with all of his heart should be under this kind of a cloud. And you're sitting there saying, I don't even know what he's talking about. Well, then you've not been very close to the Lord. You, if you don't know something about this experience, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a student of, I read biographies of men that God has used. I don't know a single man of God over all the years that I've studied biographies that hasn't gone through this. One of the great preachers, one of my favorite preachers, <clears throat> walked down the streets of London, one of the godliest preachers in the, on the face of the earth, and he looks in a mirror one day in the streets of London, he said, I've got the blackest heart in Britain. I've got the blackest heart. This man, he had a sense of how, how frail he was without the Holy Ghost. And he, he was, he was often the great Spurgeon would, would have days of melancholy where he would think he has accomplished absolutely nothing and this would come upon him and he couldn't understand. He would cry out to God, go out into his garden and raise his hands and say, God, I've never wanted you more and now why? I am in a situation here now where I am drained. It wasn't physical. It was a spiritual attack of discouragement. It's from the pits of hell. It's a spirit that comes right out of hell. David has voiced the universal cry of a righteous soul enduring an attack of discouragement. And when under this attack, I tell you, God is very patient with us. Very, very patient with our helplessness, our, our sense of helplessness. But the scriptures are very clear. Now listen to me, please. The scriptures are very clear that in this time of discouragement, when you go through it, and I told you if it's not for you today, file it. Get the tape. I don't make any profit out of it. And, and uh, you'll say, I remember now. I'm going through one of those times. I better get that out and listen to it. But you see... The scriptures make it very, very clear we must never allow unbelief to set in in those times. Never. You can talk to God all you want to about how how you feel like you're a failure, how you are not doing this or doing that, not understanding this or that. You, you can go through that. You can ask him, Lord, why and how is this happening to me? But don't ever entertain a thought. Don't ever think a thought or say one word about God not hearing your prayer or being unfaithful to you. Very, very serious. In fact, I want you to go to Numbers 21 and show you how serious that is. Numbers 21st chapter. Starting with verse 4 through verse 7. Numbers 21. Do you have that? And the Lord speak 
and, and they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to compass the land of Edom. And the soul of the people was what? Much discouraged because of the way. And the people spake against God and Moses. Wherefore have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there's no bread, neither is there any water. And our soul loatheth this light bread, this manna, in other words. And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people. And they bit the people, and much people of Israel died. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Pray unto the Lord that he would take away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people. Now look at me, please. When, when God, a loving Heavenly Father, has to send fiery serpents, and I read, He sent fiery serpents, it bit them, and they died. When people are dying of snake bite, I've got to take this serious. I can't overlook it. I've got to look at it straight out. God will not allow this among his elect, those who love him with all their heart. You know, this, this is the number one sin against our precious Lord that after all that he's done for us, when we go through difficult times, that we allow unbelief to set into our hearts. Beware of unbelief. Beware of accusing God of not being there, of not hearing your cry. Now, let me share with you how the Holy Ghost has taught me to deal with these times when they come. Now, folks, before you think that any of these men sitting up here are angels and don't go through what you go through and what I go through, forget it. They all have gone through this. I need to hear some more amens from this side over here. <laughs> I know Brother Carter has. He shared it with me on a number of occasions. This is, this is something that only, really only the godly can understand. Now, <clears throat> when, 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 when this comes on you suddenly, let me tell you how you can tell it's an attack of Satan. When, when you are seeking the Lord with all your heart, you're loving him. You're not living in sin. It doesn't mean that you have won all your victories, but you are, you are trusting the Holy Spirit to sanctify you. You're turning to him with all of your heart. You're into his word. You love him. You're not walking in rebellion or pride. And suddenly this spirit, this sense of total discouragement hits you. You can be sure it's an attack. Of Satan. Now, folks, once you know that, then that gives you the key to deal with it. You've got to know that. Rather than sit around trying to figure all the whys and the wherefores, Lord, how did it happen? Why did it happen? And sitting up half the night. No. You recognize it for what it is. It's a spirit. I didn't bring it on myself. It's come directly from Satan because I set my heart to seek God. Let me give you some of the ways that God has taught me by his Holy Spirit to drive this spirit away. First of all, don't try to maneuver your way out on your own. Don't try to get out of it on your own skill or your own wit. It's impossible. This is too big. This spirit is too strong. It's above your human skill. You can't maneuver your way out. And getting on the telephone, trying to call a friend or calling somebody or a whole group of people or trying to get into some uh, uh, seminar group or some uh, little group that you can share your guts and spill everything in your heart, it's not going to do you any good. Not at this point. If you're going to go there, you go in victory, but it's not going to help. All the people talk in the world is not going to get you up. This is the spirit. This is a spiritual matter, and you're not going to get out through any fleshly ever. In a time of great discouragement, David could not figure out why he was so cast down and so disquiet in his heart. He said, why are you cast down, O my soul? And why art thou disquieted in me? Now, amazingly, he says that, and the, the chapter begins like this. Here's how that, where, where Paul, where David is saying, I don't know where this came from. I don't know why I'm so 
disquieted and so discouraged. I don't know. Because the chapter starts out with these, with, with, with this. Amazing. As the heart panteth after the water brooks, so panteth my soul after thee. O oh God, my soul thirsteth for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? <laughs> He's saying, Lord, there's never been a time I've loved you more. There's never been a time I wanted to be in your presence more. God, I, I hunger for you like the deer, the thirsty deer that's been running over the hills. I am so thirsty for you, O oh God. So why am I cast down? Why do I, why am I experiencing this absolute total discouragement? I want you to know David's not being judged. He's not being chastened for his sin. He's not walking in apathy. He's not in compromise. In fact, he's at that point in his life that he's never hungered or thirsted more than he is right now at this time. Now, there were times in David's life that he knew the pain of sin. He, he knew what the chastening of the Lord was. He'd been chastened many times when he numbered the people, numbered the soldiers of Israel. When he committed adultery with Bathsheba, he knew the chastening rod of God. Oh, he knew it well. And sure, that brought a measure of discouragement. But David is examined his heart and he said, I can't see in that and I don't know why. He, he, if there was something there, he would have told us. He said, I, I, I can't see it because other times he would say, I've sinned greatly. I, I, I've grieved the Lord, but here he can't understand it because he has not grieved the Lord. This is not something he's brought on himself. Now there are people Many today who are discouraged because they've been living in rebellion. And there may be some of you right now are, are saying, well, yeah, I'm in totally discouraged. But you're discouraged because the Holy Ghost has been trying to help you get victory in your life. And you have shut him out and gone the way of the flesh. And that will lead to a lot of pain and discouragement. But I'm talking to the repentant today. I'm talking to those who are seeking God with all of their heart. There's something different here. And David finally cries out, Lord, my soul is cast down in me, and I don't know why. It's cast down in me, and I don't know why. The, David, the devil has a reason to cast this cloud upon the devoted righteous. <clears throat> because... As I told you, discouragement is his most potent weapon. And he's used this weapon on godly people from the very beginning, especially since the cross. And I'll tell you why he does it. The day you get serious with God, the day you say no more games, the day you said, the Lord you said to seek me, I'm going to seek you with all my heart. And the day you get into this word and you start digging in and say, I want to know who Christ is. I want to walk according to his mind. And you have set your heart to follow him diligently. Not in your own strength and power, but you are trusting God. I tell you, you have been set up as a mark. You are set up as a mark. And you, you could better believe it. You better know it. I'm warning you, it's going to come. You may be shouting all day today in Times Square Church. You may dance. You may say this is the greatest day of joy I've ever had. Watch out tomorrow. You become the devil's main target for this attack of discouragement. You're not to think it's strange, however, when it comes. As if some strange thing has happened to you. As though, well, God's spanking me. God's mad at me. God's hurt. God, God's after something. I haven't yielded yet. Yes, he is. He's after faith. You allow the devil to test you and put you in the fire to test your faith to see if you'll hold on to him. Amen. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fire trial, which is to try as though some strange thing has happened to you. It's not strange. 
Every time you think it's strange to happen to you, you think of Pastor Wilkins, Pastor Carl, and the rest of your pastors going through the same thing. It can't be strange if they're going through it, and I'm going through it, and God's people have gone through it for years. It's not a strange thing. It's common to all flesh. Number two, when you're down and you're under attack of discouragement from hell, number two, go to prayer and give the Holy Spirit time to do his work. Because this is the work of the Holy Spirit. It's not your job, it's not mine, it's the work of the Holy Spirit. When you're under attack, when the spirit of discouragement is upon you, you're not going to feel much like praying. But I'll tell you what, you go, whether you feel like it or not, you go into a secret place and you shut the door and you just talk honest to God. In these times, he's not interested in you being very intense, fervent, saying some brilliant thing. Go sit on the floor. Lay down if you have to. You don't even have to pray. Just say, help. <laughs> Just sit in his presence. And even you have to think your prayer. Lord, I'm sorry, but I've reached the end. I am down, period. I can't play games with you, Lord. I'm down. I'm going through it. I've had it. Lord, if I get out of it, you have to get me out of it. I can't even reach up and touch you. And don't try to be spiritual. I'll tell you, at this time, you're as spiritual as you can be if you're under the blood and trusting the Lord. But this time, it's not that you're unspiritual. It's not that you're being chastened. It's not that God's mad at you. The enemy has come to press you down and try to get you to just throw in the towel and give up and say, I don't understand God. Folks, I've been there. I, I've known what it is to go in and say, Lord, I don't understand Paul. I don't understand the old man, the new man. I don't understand death to self when sin's still there. I don't understand it, Lord. If you are going to help me, you're going to have to send the Holy Ghost and open my eyes because the light of my eyes has gone out. I hear the preachers get up and talk as though they don't have any problems and they don't, they got it all figured out and I'm sitting there, well, where am I? I don't have it all figured out. I got to get it from the Holy Ghost day by day. And he has to give an understanding. And the Lord's big. And I want to tell you something. The Holy Ghost isn't as fickle as we think he is. We get the idea that every time we, we, we fail the Lord, every time we go through something, the Holy Ghost splits away. The Puritan divines taught that, that, that there are times when we fail the Lord, the Holy Ghost leaves. But I could never accept that. Why would the Holy Ghost leave when I need him the most? And if the Holy Ghost is a sanctifier, and I'm in a need for sanctification, and he's not there to do it, I'm left to the powers of hell. And if I've, if I've grieved the Holy Ghost and he's gone, I don't even know why I grieved him. Because he's gone. It doesn't make sense to me. No, he's, I'm not going to leave you. And I will pray the Father, Jesus said, he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. In, in, in the, that, that's Old Testament theology. And there's only one place you can find there where you left him for a season to test him. But that's before the Holy Ghost had poured out. David had to encourage himself in the Lord, but not under the New Testament. That's the work of the Holy Ghost. He's the comforter. Yeah. Glory to God. He's the, Paul calls him the spirit that dwelleth. He lives in you. And he's not just somebody who comes and visits. He doesn't jump in and out of my life 
just because, you see, he's stronger than you. <laughs> we get the idea he's flighty. That he's fickle, he gets so easily hurt. No, the love of God sent him there to deal with all these very things. Hallelujah. So if this has been your prayer, Lord, you're going to have to bring me out of this. But if you will just wait in his presence, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. But that's as you go to the Lord. Don't go to the telephone. Go quickly. The moment this is, folks, this thing can set in on you. It can set in and stay for days and weeks and finally bring depression to your life. The moment it comes, go into the secret closet, shut the door and get alone with God and just spill your heart out to him. And even if you don't have any, you, there are times you say, I, don't, I can't even cry. I don't even have any tears. He's not asking you to shed a bucket of tears. He's just asking you to be dead honest with him. Open up your heart and let him come take you by the hand. The first thing the Holy Ghost is going to do is expose all the lies of the devil. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things. He will bring to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. I, I was remembering this past week an experience similar to David that I went through. And it came to me at a time when I was, to my knowledge, closer to the Lord than ever been in all my ministry. I had been shut in with God. I had been seeking Him. I mean, hours and hours. I had been pouring my heart to Him. I had been in the Word. I was in revelation knowledge. I was fruitful. I was being mightily blessed of God. But... <clears throat> I was sitting one day at my desk and having prayed and I had my Bible out and I needed a message. And at mid-morning and sitting there for two or three hours and there was nothing. The words were running together and I felt so empty and I felt so drained. It wasn't health. It wasn't anything else. And and I, I suddenly closed the Bible and I walked around <clears throat> in the house and that spirit was on me. There it was. Incredible. I, I, I couldn't explain it. it. It was one of those downcast moments of discouragement. I, I wasn't in debt. I had no family crisis, no sin. That they could point. There was no condemnation, no guilt, no fear. But I was down. I know it wasn't my health. I was full of vitamins. <laughs> Physically, I felt great. Mentally, no reason to be tired. That's when I recognized it as a spirit. And I suddenly felt absolutely drained. I said, Lord, I am wiped out. I have nothing to give to anybody else. I am just empty. I've poured out my soul. I don't see anything there. I can't get a message. I, I can't pray. I can't study. It was there. I just felt lowly drained. I, I went to the Lord, and I just sat uh, down on the floor, and I said, Lord, <clears throat> I don't know what to do. I really don't. I, I feel so down. I can't reach out to you. I have no tears. I... I know I love you, I've never loved you more, but I, I sure don't know why. I'm going through this, Lord, when I have, for the past two years, never prayed more, never been closer to you, never trusted you more, but now I am in this. What's it all about? And the Holy Spirit just whispered, I just sit still. Just love me. And I just sat still about 40 minutes in his presence. You see, the devil will come with lies. This is how he brings the spirit. He'll come to you and he will, he will absolutely bring lies. He, he will try to discourage you with one lie after another. He'll lie to you about your children. He'll lie to you about your family. He'll lie to you about everything. He'll try to bring fear. 
He, 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 he will just flood your mind, injecting one lie after another. But that's the work of the Holy Spirit. When you just sit still in his presence, the Lord doesn't want you to try to climb up some ladder to reach him. He said, just sit still in my presence. Just wait on the Lord. And I waited on the Lord, and suddenly a still small voice of the Holy Spirit. You are loved. You're greatly loved, David. You have no reason to be afraid. I'm not spanking you. I'm not chastening you. And the sweetest thing, all the lies that I had heard in the, in one hour before this, just flooding into my soul that <clears throat> I was not uh, uh, really accomplishing anything. I, I, I was not really seeing what I need to see in the word and that my preaching was light and all of these lies of the devil. And uh, all the past dumb things I've ever done in my life. You know the devil will bring it up to you? I mean, when you're down, he'll just replay and replay every stupid thing. All your sins, all your failures, he'll just play it until you, Wow, Lord, I'll never make it. I can't make it, Lord. That's when the Holy Spirit comes, when you wait on him, get in his presence and wait. The first thing he does, he brings to remembrance all the precious promises of Jesus. All the word of the Lord that was spoken. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I'll go with you to the end. And the Holy Spirit just flooded my soul with promises. And, and then he says, David, I'm going to tell you something. It's, it's not over for you. You haven't even started yet. The best is just ahead of you. And, and I finally stood to my feet. And I, I heard myself saying, why am I putting up with this? It's not from God. It's from the devil. And I just yelled, devil, that's enough. It's a trick. I know your devices now, and it's not going to work. I am loved by God. <clears throat> I walked toward the door of my prayer room and... The Holy Spirit said, be glad and rejoice in the Lord. You have no reason to be afraid. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. He undoes the lies of the enemy. He brings the encouragement. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Now, finally, one other step that you've got to take. That's to dare to believe the incredibly good things the Holy Ghost is going to tell you in this condition. The incredible good things God, the Holy Ghost, is going to tell you while the devil's trying to lie to you. You know, it must grieve the Heavenly Father uh, when he sees us coming into his presence so often, wanting, expecting only to be reproved. Boy, I lived for many years like that. Every time I go to God, if there was something that I didn't feel I had accomplished or lived up to some standard that I go to his presence, every time I went to the Word, I expected to be rebuked. Every time I prayed, I wanted to, that, that voice was going from the Lord, the Holy Ghost, go rebuke me. <clears throat> when are we going to come to the place when we come into his presence, ready and daring to hear the good word that he has for us? Now, I know there are people that, there, there, there are whole denominations that don't preach reproof. They don't want to hear it. All they preach is love, mercy, and grace. And, and they have misused grace. They've despised grace, turned it into lasciviousness. I, I, there are people that absolutely refuse to look into the commandments of the Lord. And we don't do that here. We try to preach the whole counsel of God. We preach the judgments of God. I, I write, we write books about it. We, we warn people. We preach against sin, yes. But folks, I'm talking to those who love the Lord. You're not living in sin and you have been depressed and you're down. You have got to believe now to dare that the Holy Ghost is going to speak to you. That God is going to fulfill every promise he's made to you. He's going to keep his word. I want you to go with me before I close to 1 Corinthians 2 to prove what I'm talking about before I close. I'll tell you, go to Isaiah first, Isaiah 64. Isaiah 64. May I hear the rustling of the leaves, please? Isaiah 64. Verse 4, 
For since the beginning of the world, men have not heard, nor perceived by the ear, neither hath the eye seen, O God, beside thee, what he hath prepared for them that waiteth for him. I've not seen, ears not heard. Folks, it's not even recorded. It hadn't even been recorded anywhere. No one has ever seen yet the good things that God has prepared for them that wait upon him. Now, Apostle Paul picks up on that in 1 Corinthians 2. If you'll go there now, 1 Corinthians 2. Paul the Apostle gets this from Isaiah 64. The very verse that I read to you, chapter 2, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9. He's quoting this very verse that I just read to you. But as it is written in Isaiah 64, 4, in other words, I have not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God, we're in the New Covenant now, we're in the New Testament. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. Now look this way, please. <clears throat> Here's how the Lord works now. When you are going through this experience, if you will go and wait on the Lord and sit in his presence, be in no hurry. He waits till your spirit is quiet. And when your spirit is quiet before the Lord, and you will reach out by faith saying, Lord, you've sent the Holy Ghost. He abides in me. He's not a silent partner. He's been sent by covenant to reveal the mind of Christ, to comfort me and strengthen me and to lead me and guide me. Holy Spirit, I turn to you in simple childlike faith now. Speak to my heart. And I want you to know God is faithful, the Holy Spirit, if you will just wait in his presence. Be in no hurry and, and wait in faith, absolute faith. You're going to hear that inner voice of the Holy Spirit. Oh, folks, this has been my life. I thank God for the Holy Spirit. I thank God for the voice of the Holy Spirit. He'll not let you be deceived. He'll not let a false voice come because your heart is hungry. He knows you're hurt. He knows when you're down. And you go to him and say, oh, Lord Jesus, you, by your spirit, give me those wings. Open up the snare of the enemy. This is from the devil himself. Now open it up. Give me the wings to fly out of this now by faith. And I tell you, he's going to show you the good things that he has ahead for you. God has a plan for everyone in this building, everyone listening to me. God has a beautiful plan. I don't care if there's a depression in the land. I don't care if the mountains fall into the sea. God's plan will not be aborted by this attack of the enemy. He cannot abort God's will in your life. He can't abort the plan of God. Impossible. God is going to keep his word to you. Hallelujah. I'll give you one last scripture, Isaiah 40, and this, with this I close. Isaiah 40. I just gave this to you a moment ago, but I want you to stand with me. If you have a King James, follow me, please. Will you stand? I want everybody to read me verse 28, 29, 30, and 31. Do you have it? Hast thou not known? Uh, read it with me. Hast thou not known? Hast thou not heard? That the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the earth, of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary. There is no searching of his understanding. He giveth power to the faint, and to them that have no might, he increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagle. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Hallelujah. You're not going down, folks. You're not going to faint. You're going to come out of this more victorious, having your faith being tested. It'll come forth as pure gold. Hallelujah. 
then the next time it comes, it won't throw you. Say, I know how to deal with this. I'm going to my Lord. I'm going to the secret closet. And I'm going to wait on the Holy Ghost. God's going to see me through it. Hallelujah. Now, folks, I would have preached this if it were only to myself. But I know better than that. I know that there are many of you in the annex, balcony, main floor, behind me, around me. Many of you here right now that if, if you're not in it at present, you've been there in the past. And I can assure you, according to the scripture, the Bible says the devil is going to come down in the last days having great wrath, coming down to the earth to try to deceive the elect. And this is his most powerful, most potent weapon. But you're not ignorant of it anymore. If you're here this morning, you say, Pastor, this message is for me. I have been going through a time of great discouragement. I didn't really know whether it was my own problem or attack of Satan, but I know it now. Up in the balcony, go to the stairs on either side and come down any aisle. I'd like to pray with you. And we're going to ask the Lord now to break this spirit. We're to take authority over that spirit. Now, if you're not saved, if you're backslidden, and you need to touch from the Lord, I want you to get out of your seat and follow these that are coming. And in the annex, if you'll just go to the lobby, the people there will show you how to get into the stairs coming down and come right into the main auditorium and come and meet me right here in the front of the church, and we'll pray with you. This is the day the Lord wants to give you victory. He wants you to leave this house rejoicing in Him this morning. Hallelujah. As they sing, wherever you're at, up in the balcony, the stairs on either side, down any aisle, and in the annex, and all the annex rooms, just go to the lobby. The ushers will show you how to get into this room. You come and meet me here, and we'll pray with you and ask the Lord to chase this spirit. We'll take his authority over it and believe, God, that you walk out of this place delivered, knowing how to deal with the enemy. Lord, you that have come forward, look this way, please. <clears throat> I want you to help me now. The Bible said, if two or three agree together concerning anything in earth, it shall be done of the Father in heaven. And we're going to ask, I'm going to ask you to join me as I pray that the Lord lift the spirit. I'm going to pray in faith right now. Look at me, please. Do you understand that this is from the enemy? That the devil is just trying to get you discouraged so that you'll jettison and get rid of your faith. So that you'll think that God doesn't hear your prayers, that God's not interested in you, that he doesn't love you anymore. Or that he's mad at you. God, you know, the devil's won a great victory. He just may convince you that God's mad at you. He's not mad at you. The Holy Spirit is here right now to deliver you by his mighty power. He wants to do that now. <clears throat> I want everybody that came forward, just close your eyes. I don't want you to lift one hand to the Lord. It's, it's just say, Lord, I, I'm just telling you now, I'm reaching out that you take my hand right now. I want you to pray this with me right now. Jesus, I come to you. I have no strength of my own, no power of my own, no authority of my own. I can't win by myself. I can't do it on my own. But you have the power. Holy Spirit, I believe you. Lord Jesus, cleanse me. Blot out my sins. Take all my failures and put them under the blood. Lord Jesus, I believe your word. And I come now to be delivered from the spirit of discouragement and the bondage of fear. Now, I'm going to pray, and I want you to believe God as I pray right now that that spirit, because of your faith and your trust in the Lord, and because the Lord has turned the light on and you know it's from the enemy, I want you to believe God right now, right now, that he's going to lift this spirit and chase it. We're going to ask God right now to do the work. And every one of you, raise your right hand and let's believe God right now. Will you trust him? Lord, I come now in Jesus' name and take your authority over every spirit of discouragement, 
every bondage of fear and guilt and condemnation that has been injected into the hearts and minds of your people by the devil himself. Satan, you have no power, you have no authority because the Holy Spirit has come. The Holy Spirit has come to drive out by the Spirit of Truth. The Spirit of Truth. Now I want you to pray this with me. Jesus, the Spirit upon me is from Satan. I reject it. Dear Jesus, by your Spirit, you bind it. You cast it out. Because I stand on your word and your eternal promises. I can be free right now. I shall rejoice and be glad in the Lord. Now just tell him you love him. Just thank him right now, Lord. I give you thanks. I give you praise. Hallelujah. We're going to sing a rejoicing song here in just a moment, but listen, you've got to take a step of faith right now. This recording is provided by Times Square Church in New York City. You're welcome to make additional copies for free distribution to friends. All other unauthorized duplication or electronic transmission is a violation of copyright and other applicable laws. This recording cannot be posted on any website. However, written permission to link to the Times Square Church homepage may be requested by emailing info at timesquarechurch.org. Other recordings are available by calling 1-800-488-0854 or by writing to Times Square Church Tape Ministry, 1657 Broadway, New York, New York, 10019. I have a prophetic word this morning. Uh, it's been quite a while since the Lord has entrusted me to bring a prophetic message, but this is very strong in my heart. I want you to turn to Isaiah 24. Isaiah 24, my message, in one hour, everything's going to change. In one hour. 24th chapter of Isaiah. I'm going to read just the first few verses. And then you leave your Bible open because I'm going to keep coming back to this. It's the prophecy is all here. It's not my prophecy. It's, I, it's the Lord's prophecy given through Isaiah, his holy prophet. Behold, the Lord maketh the earth empty and maketh it waste and turns it upside down and scatters abroad the inhabitants thereof. It shall be as with the people, so with the priest, as with the servant, so with his master, with the maid, so with her mistress, as with the buyer, the seller, as with the lender, the borrower, as with the taker of usury, so the giver of usury. Land shall be emptied and spoiled, for the Lord has spoken this word. Father, in love and brokenness, I come to this congregation with something that you placed on my heart, something prophesied many, many years ago, aimed at this very generation and this time. Lord, I pray that you awaken our hearts, that, that we would not tremble, we would not fear, but we would trust your word to bring strength to us. Now, Lord, come upon me by your Holy Spirit. Let me speak the word of the living God with confidence and faith. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. God, through the prophet Isaiah said, a time is coming. God said, I'm going to turn everything upside down. And the scripture makes it very clear. It says, behold, the Lord maketh the earth empty and maketh it waste and turneth it upside down. There's a sudden judgment coming to this world. And it's at the door. And I want you to hear what the prophet Isaiah is saying. It's not my message. Now, if you're tied to this world, if you're in love with the things of this world and you are not walking with the Lord, you're not wanting to hear, you will not want to hear this and you may want to just cast it aside and say, well, I'll endure this message. It, 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 and even if you are a born again Christian, if you love the Lord and you're close to him, if you didn't believe that this is the pure word of God, there may be a tendency not to take it serious. But this is the word of God. It is not man's prophecy. There are a lot of 
prophecies going forth in the world, and, and they are, uh, I don't know whether you would call them scripturally based or not, but this is scripture. This is the living word of God. And if you believe this is the pure word of God, then you have to open your heart to what the prophet Isaiah has to say this morning. In one hour, the world is going to change, the scripture says. In fact, when you get to Revelation 8th chapter, John warned in one day, death and mourning, yea, in one hour, an utter burning and judgment will come. That's the 18th chapter of Revelation. And it confirms that this is going to happen. Jesus said it's going to be when all men cry peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes. A sudden, unexpected destruction comes from the hand of the Lord. Isaiah warns that there, he mentions a city. In fact, a number of prophets do, but most uh, eminent Bible scholars, and I've checked through my library, and they believe, as I do, that this prophecy that we're hearing this morning from Isaiah is, at, is, is directed to this generation. And in just a moment, I'll enlarge on that and tell you why I believe we can pinpoint it into our very generation, our time. In one day, in one hour, and he says at that time, there, there was going to be a great burning. Now, secular prophets and those in homeland security, whether it's in the United States or England or Germany, all over the world now, they, they are saying that, that there is going to come a nuclear accident or a nuclear holocaust coming to a city. They often name New York City. You, you know what's happened here. We lived through the 9-11 experience. And you could look out of the apartment, especially where we are, and you could see the burning and see the fire and the smoke ascending to heaven. And a few weeks ago, remember the eruption of the steam pipe and uh, the earth opened up and swallowed a truck and you saw pictures of people running everywhere and they're screaming, is this it, is this it? They're thinking nuclear. And the scripture says, if, when you go through I. Isaiah, the 24th chapter, it, it says that the gates are going to be dissolved. The gates are going to be uh, devastated. That means the exits and entrances. We don't know where it is. The city is named and a burning and a fire is mentioned here. I've been prophesying for a number of years that uh, of something I saw when I was on the street and in, <clears throat> on uh, Broadway and 42nd Street. And it's come back to me many, many times of a thousand bur fires burning in this particular city we, in which we live. But you see, I don't know where it is. He doesn't name the city, but he does say that there, there, there is going to be a sudden destruction that's going to change everything. The world is going to change in one hour. The church is going to change in one hour. And we as individuals are going to change in one hour. Now, this message is not to frighten because if, if you're confident that you're saved and under the blood of Christ and redeemed, you know that anything like this happens, it's instant glory. We pass from life into death. And like the Apostle Paul said, we should be of this mindset that we thank God for this world. We thank God for our life. But our preference is to go and be with Christ. That should be the desire in your heart. The scripture said the fear of death is a dominion. It's a terror. And Paul said, you've lived all your life that way. But he said, God says he doesn't want you to live that way. He wants to deliver us from the fear of death. And if we lose the fear of death through trusting in Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit, we will not fear no matter what happens, what the newscast is, what anybody says, or a message such as this. You, you will only be moved to awaken to what the, the Lord says to do. And... But, let me not get ahead of myself here. We don't know where this is going to happen. First of all, the hour is going to come when the whole world is going to change. Now, eminent Bible scholars believe that chapter 24 and 25 of Isaiah have to do with our time this very day. A sudden cataclysmic event is going to strike, and the Bible, Isaiah says... The lofty, this is 26 verse 5, the lofty, meaning the proud city, will be laid low even to the ground. 
Bible, then according to the prophet, there is utter chaos. And folks, you can go out in the street here on this Sunday afternoon, go right outside the door on a sunny day and say, how could it happen that in one hour there could be such confusion where government can't do anything about it, societal agencies can't do anything about it because even when 9-11 struck this city, they came from all over the world. They poured in from all the United States, firemen, police officers, and helpers, and uh, there was uh, armies of people wanting to help. But, folks, this cataclysmic event makes very, is made very clear in the Scripture it's going to be beyond human ability to cope with. And, and even now, we, we listen to our secular prophets, and they, they talk about trying to prepare, but there, there is... There's coming a day that in one hour, society changes. A whole world changes. The Bible says the merchants will weep and weep and wail and cry because no one is buying their merchandise. They're all sellers and no buyers. This past week, the <clears throat> director or the CEO of a large fund put his 142-foot yacht for sale. His 16-bedroom house in Aspen went up for sale because his high-risk funds are fading and he's in deep trouble and it happened overnight. And, and now all of these risk funds, mortgage companies going bankrupt left and right. And, and we are facing an incredible monster economic upheaval. I've been warning about that. I stood in this pulpit a year ago, this Sunday, I think it was, or, or within one or two Sundays, warning about the mortgage market and telling people if you're flipping houses and you don't know how to do that, you're not a real estate agent, get out. We warned about that. And because you say, well, why warn? What's the purpose of that? Why don't you just wait till it happens? Why live on any kind of anxiety? Why put this burden upon us? But remember what Jesus said when he first saw the destruction of Jerusalem. He said, there's going to be a, this city is going to burn to the ground. And he said, I'm telling you now so that when it happens, you'll believe. You'll believe that there is a God who so loved you. He warns you. And, and he, he said, that it, there's going, this, this, this city is going to the ground and there won't be one stone left upon another in the temple. And Jesus warned. He said, now, I'm warning you for a reason. So that when it happens, when you see these things come up, you'll understand that you were loved. And, and Paul the Apostle, when he's talking about the sudden destruction, he called that information light. He said, you're members of the body walking in light. You're getting Holy Ghost insight. He said, you're not in the darkness. You won't walk in darkness. So that when these sudden things come, and, and there's panic all around you. There's going to be something happen to you by the Holy Spirit. There's going to be something that quickens you and say, well, my God warned me. There were true, true, word, true words that came forth from the pulpit, and we were, we were warned. Even though in this day of prosperity, nobody wants to hear it. I don't want to hear it. But folks, it is here, and I'll tell you why this message is being brought forth this morning before I close. He said the dreams are going to fade. He, he goes on to say that the music is going to fade, the, of the zithers or the guitars, and, and the, the, uh, there's, there's going to be such a change. Everything is going to change in this world in one hour. If, if there were a nuclear attack on Jerusalem or Tel Aviv, any city in Israel, I told you about the Samson option. And, and they have such a radar system. They have such protective uh, equipment that as soon as a missile's released toward Israel, within moments, they have about a minute, maybe a minute and a half, according to some experts, and retaliatory missiles would hit and strike and wipe out every enemy of Israel. Folks, I'm going to talk to you in just a, a moment about why 
I believe that the, that the prophet Isaiah is talking about our day. First of all, by the growing number of prophets warning of an apocalyptic moment coming. Now, when I talk about prophets, I'm not talking about just church prophets. I'm talking about secular prophets because God uses secular prophets. These are experts. These are scientists. And remember in the scripture, God said of, of Assyria, Assyria is my rod against Israel to correct them. In other words, Assyria is doing my will. I am speaking through Assyria to my people. And remember also about Cyrus. The scripture said of Cyrus, he's a heathen king. And when you get to Amos, Amos the prophet said, Cyrus is God speaking through him, said, Cyrus is my shepherd and he's doing my bidding. So when, when you hear all of these secular uh, scientists and all of these these are not church people. These are not religious people. They're, they are saying it's at the door. Uh, what about the sensuality? What about all of this nonchalance? What about this racing for money and gold and greed? Wall Street has become the greediest source of, of, of vile corruption in man's history. They have taken this nation into such risk and such depth, there, debt, there is no way out of it. And we live right at the foot of, we, it's right at the, <clears throat> just blocks away from where I'm preaching this morning. And the second reason, you, you see, what I'm preaching this morning is mild compared to what I hear now. Is that right or wrong? What you hear in the news and what you hear constantly fed so that we just want to turn it off. But you see, God moves. God moves in. <clears throat> these, these are the warning times when prophets are speaking because the scripture says the Lord <clears throat> will do nothing until he speaks through his prophets, through Amos. God said, I don't do anything until I warn through my prophets. And the second reason why... I believe we can assume that what Isaiah is warning speaks to our generation. God always moves in judgment. He always acts when the cup of violence overflows. Violence. Now, folks, let me speak plainly to you from the depths of my soul. I'm not a prophet. I've never claimed to be a prophet. I'm a watchman. Just one of many. But listen to me now. There is no greater violence in the sight of God than the violence of pedophiles. Those who are raping children. Those who are stealing children right off the streets and taking them to, to the Far East and putting them in brothels in India and all the, the Far East. And, and here in the United States, an entire church denomination paying hundreds of millions of dollars to settle lawsuits because their little children were sodomized. Folks, when you turn to Dafar and you find that hundreds and even thousands of little children were shedded to death. When you think of the thousands and thousands of babies aborted in the United States and around the world, and that blood cries from the ground, and the Bible says God destroyed Noah's age, because the earth was filled with violence. And God said, I can't handle it anymore. I can't take it. I will not take it. And he was patient for 120 years, a strong, faithful preaching, a prophetic word. And then God saw. And folks, I believe now, think of the, the murdering in our schools, the the. terrorizing of our children. You can, you can harden. What are we doing? Getting hardened to the news? Does it not move us anymore? I can tell you it moves the heart of God. And I believe that blood cries from the ground. How long do you think God will endure? How long do you think God will put up with this? Even here now, 
on the internet, a pedophile is taking pictures and, and telling pedophiles where to go to find the children where it's easiest to pick up a child. And he's allowed to do it and had, can't be stopped. Folks, that's all going to change. This is all going to change in one hour. Secondly, sudden destruction. <clears throat> when it comes, is going to change the church. In one hour, the church is going to change. It's going to change dead churches. It's going to change live churches. The prophet pictures a great shaking as though God took an olive tree that had already been harvested and he begins to shake it. In other words, there's been a harvest, but there's still God said, I'm going to shake everything that can be shaken. I'm going to turn everything upside down, according to the prophet. In this time of shaking, though, something is going to happen that's so incredible. If you have your Bibles <clears throat> open, I want you to go to verse 14. Now, before you do that, don't get ahead of me, please. Look this way. Now, remember, this is a time of, of cataclysmic devastation. This is a time that's so incredibly dark. This is a time of fire. And in the middle of that, what about God's people? What's happening in the church? The apostasy is going to change overnight. Everything that we see that is wrong in the church of Jesus Christ is going to change. But in the house of God, there's going to be a revival. And I want you to see it, folks. And if you, it, it, this one, I, I saw and began to pray over it and began to study and do my research on this. See, this is not, I didn't get along with God and pray and say, God, talk to me. Put in my head what's going to happen. I have people all over the world, wherever I travel, say, Brother Dave, you speak of prophetic. What's, what's next? What's coming? I said, I don't know. I don't know. I'll go to my Bible. If God speaks it through his word, then I believe it and then I'll preach it. So I see this and it makes me shout. I know what's coming and you know what's coming. But folks think God's interest is in his church. In the church of Jesus Christ, his overcoming church. And the Bible said in the middle of this, there's going to be a song rise up. From the islands of the sea, from the uttermost parts of the world, there's going to be a song rise up in the middle of all of this. Look at it, verse 14. Then shall they lift up. First, verse 13, when thus it shall be in the midst of the land among the people, there's going to be a great shaking. What's happening during the shaking? Verse 13, verse 14, then they, in other words, they shall lift up their voice. They shall sing for the majesty of the Lord. They shall cry aloud from the sea. Wherefore, glorify you the Lord in the fires. Did you hear it? <laughs> There should be an amen coming from the glory of your soul because in the middle of the fire, God's going to have a people who are not in panic. God is going to have a people that are going to praise the majesty of Almighty God. He said, in the fires you will sing. There's a song coming to the church of Jesus Christ. Folks, we're not going down. We're going up. We are going up. There shall be a song in the midst of the fire. Verse 16, for the, from the uttermost part of the earth, have we heard what? Not weeping, not groaning, not murmuring, not complaining, not agonizing. But you hear a song coming from China, and then you hear it from India. You hear it coming out of the tribes of Africa, out of Darfur, out of every nation. It's coming from every island of the sea. It's coming from the United States and Canada, South America, the whole world, for the uttermost part of the world. I hear a song, the prophet said. I hear a, I hear people who are facing calamity. I hear people that uh, seemingly have no hope. And there's a song. There's a choir. We heard... Over 150 voices here this morning singing. Can you imagine 
the great sound that was coming out of the 150. Can you imagine millions and millions of people around the world singing the song when this hour comes? It's coming in the darkest time of all. I, I, I believe that, <clears throat> that something's going to happen among our youth, especially college students. Do you understand that for, for, the, for the past 10 years especially, our children, our young people are going into colleges and their faith is being robbed? That ungodly atheistic teachers and professors have our young people as prisoners for three, four, five, and six years. And they keep bombarding them till there's no faith. They, they leave believing there is no God. Till like in Sweden, 80% of the people now say they're, the population that there's no God. Don't believe in God. 20% believe in God. And many, many students. And folks, I believe that's going to change because in one hour, when everybody is waking and when the world is shaking and trembling, those professors are going to be looking for somebody to give them a word. Prosperity preachers are going to get their Bibles out looking for something to say to the people saying, what's happened? Why didn't you warn us? But I believe that in that time, everything in college is going to change. Oh, yes. All the survivors. You see, this is not, I'm not talking about the end of the world. There's still ahead. There's, the, 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 things are going to change in one hour. But there's still, we're talking about in the future beyond that, the Antichrist. And, but you see, the Antichrist can't come to power until there's chaos. It has to come out of chaos. Hitler came out of chaos. The Antichrist is going to come out of a chaotic world where he, there, there is something of wisdom. There's something given to him, a demonic power that brings people some kind of hope. I'm talking about the secular world. But folks, this is all about to change. Now the Bible says we as individuals are going to change. In one hour, we're going to have our focus in life changed, our entire focus. We will no longer be obsessing about our own problems and adversities. We won't be, we won't be focused on me. We won't be focused on our problems as serious as they are and, and as challenging as they may be. God, it's very clear. This will not be our focus. That's all going to be changed. Everything that was once dear to us. It's, it's no longer going to have value it's, it, other than those things that are of the spirit and of love and of Christ. Things that we held dear are, are going to be held and, and absolutely are going to vanish. By this, meaning the calamity, shall the iniquity of Jacob be purged when he turns all the stones into dust. This is Isaiah 27, 9. He said, I'm going to take all the idols. And he said, by this, in other words, this great cataclysmic event is going to bring down all the idols. All the idols are going to be crushed to stone, is what the Bible says. Here's the promise from the book of Isaiah, 27th chapter. He said, in that day, all the idols will be trampled to dust. They're not going to, the last thing the world's going to be talking about is sports. I have nothing in sports. I like sports. I'm a football fan. But, you know, the Bible says it's going to be good. They're not going to be any more $250 million settlement for these people in a starving world. He said it's all going to change. It goes even deeper than that. Let me find it here in the scripture. It shall be. Here's where we're going to be in a level field. Listen to this very please. And it shall be as with the people, so with the priest, as with the servant, so with his master, as with the maid, so with his mistress, or the buyer and the seller, as with the lender and the buyer. Everything will be brought to a same level, whether it's presidents, world leaders, those in poverty, all going to face the same struggles, the same conditions. <clears throat> Nothing will There'll be no respect of persons. Are you ready for some comfort? 
<laughs> I said, are you ready for some comfort? Yeah. Folks, I don't like to preach like this. For the last six weeks, I've preached nothing but grace. I risk people getting mad. Every time I've had to preach much like this, people leave. But one day I stand before God. And he said, if you see these things coming and you don't warn, the blood's on your hand. And I read that and tremble. There should be no one that comes to Times Square Church surprised. Should, you don't sit around waiting for things to happen. But let me tell you what Paul the Apostle said. I want you to follow this very closely before I close. Paul said, <clears throat> he has not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us so that whether we wake or sleep, whether we, we, we will live together with him. He said, comfort yourself. He, he's talking about sudden destruction. He's talking about time that we're going to be with the Lord. And he said, I want you to comfort one another. Comfort one another. And he said, whether we live or die. And folks, that's where we have to come to right now. You, you, you watch the news in the next 30 days, and especially the next two weeks. Yeah, listen to, to what's happening to the economy. Listen and just remember God speaking, not to make you afraid, but to prepare your heart. He said, you're to put on the breastplate of faith. This is Paul the Apostle said, in these times when we live under the threat of a sudden destruction or the knowledge of a sudden destruction coming on the earth. When, when, when this has been told to us and when we see it and we hear it. He, he said, you're not to tremble. You're not to sorrow as the world sorrows. He said, no. He, he said, you go about comforting one another and speak to one another, saying, live or die, we're the Lord's. Now, it comes down to this. Co going to your friends, going to the body of Christ, went out to them and shake hands and look right in the eye and say, live or die, we're the Lord's. That's what Paul said. You're going to encourage one another and say, we live or die, we will go and live with Christ. We are headed for eternal life in Christ. Folks, I'm asking God, and I, I more and more, you say, well, you can come to that because you're old man now. But you see, I'm coming to a place now where I'm not going to live in fear. I don't live in fear. I want to be here in the United States. I want to be here in New York City if anything happens to this city. I want to be here in the middle of it. And I don't want the fear of death to have dominion over me. And you can't have freedom. You can't have freedom until you comfort yourself with the word of God, saying, I will, whatever happens, if it happens tomorrow, bless God, I'm going to be shouting on the streets of glory with all the saints of God. I'm going to pass from death into life. This, we're not to live in fear. We're not to live in bondage. You say, well, Brother Dave, you already put us in fear, and now you're trying to get us out of it. No, that's the work of the Holy Spirit. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. Glory be to God. I, I, my message today is that there's a song coming out of this. And if you leave this building, if you leave this building discouraged, if you walk out of here and say that's nothing but gloom and doom, yes, it is on a human level. But on a spiritual level, it's life eternal. It's life And I just have a secret thought in my heart. It's probably just David Wilkerson's thoughts. But I have a feeling, just as before 9-11, the Holy Spirit moved in this church and other congregations and warned us there were moments of silence. Sometime 15 minutes we sat in this church just before the blast. And God was speaking to us not to be afraid. And I, it's going to be different this time. I believe that... If something is going to happen in this city or wherever it happens, the saints of God are going to be quickened by the Holy Spirit. And there's going to be some singing and shouting and praising of God to encourage the body to strengthen their spirit. Now get up on your feet.
I bind the spirit of fear in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. He's not given us the spirit of fear, but love and power and a sound mind. Folks, I've got the Holy Ghost all over me right now. I have the Holy Spirit upon my soul. He wants to come upon you. The Holy Spirit wants to quicken you. Take the fear out of your heart. You young people that are in the choir, the young people that are listening to me right now, there is a future. There, the whole world thinks there's no future. Folks, this is just the beginning of our future. This is just the beginning of our future. Hallelujah. I feel good. There are going to be a lot of people listening to this tape, tuned it out too quick. They turned it off. They should have stayed and listened to the praises and the shouts of God's people in this house. <laughs> Hallelujah. There shall be a song. Somebody ask you this afternoon or tomorrow, next week, what did Pastor Dave preach? You say, revival. A song in a hard time. And I've got to say this in closing. Listen very carefully, please. You're to sing in your present fire, in your adver ad adversity, in your hard time, financial, whatever it may be. You've got to get a song. You say, does God expect me to sing? I don't care what it is. There should be that little quiet. There's something very quiet and steadfast in the soul that sings, great is our God. See, he said they're going to sing about the majesty of God. Great is our God. Folks, I walk these streets and I sing. I sing in spite of, of, of crises. I sing in spite of all those things. There's something God puts in the heart. And you've got to get your song now. That'll be too late. Get it now. Get a hold of your song. There's a song in the night, but there's a song in the fire. Some of you are in a fire. The Bible says, build up your faith. The apostle Paul said, put on the breastplate of hope, uh, of faith and love and hope. Oh, praise God for the hope that is in our hearts. Now, we have a, a space here in the front of the church. We, we refer to it as the altar, another place to meet God. And I invite you, if you're here this morning, and God has spoken to you. You see, uh, God's not interested in you changing your life through fear, but through hope. And that's what this meeting is all about, hope. And you're here this morning and your hope has been staggered because you're going through a crisis in your life. And you say, well, Brother Dave, everybody's got some kind of a crisis. But I'm talking about a, a real serious thing that, that only God could give you a song. And there's been some, we call it the blues or depression, if you're standing here with the sound of my voice in the annex upstairs here, wherever we're at in this audience, and you need a touch, an absolute touch of God, you need the spirit of fear to be broken in you so you can walk out of this building. Maybe that fear is because you're not walking with Christ as you did or should. Maybe you've drifted away. Maybe you walked in here and you've never known what it is to have what people call a new birth or you've never surrendered your life to Jesus Christ. I invite you to get out of your seat upstairs, wherever you are, and even in the annex, you can go to the lobby and they'll show you how to get down here in the front of this church and we will pray for you. You can come even while I'm talking. Just get out of your seat, up the balcony, go to the stairs on either side and come down. And we're going to believe God for a, a tremendous 
uh, change. Everything shall change in an hour. This can change you in the next five minutes. There can be a change in your life, and the Lord can cleanse you, change your direction, and bring hope and life to your whole, your body, soul, mind, and the spirit. Heavenly Father, I pray that you walk through this congregation, move through this congregation, and find everyone that needs a miracle, a life-changing miracle, and those who would believe with us, would believe with us for that change in Jesus' name. And while they're singing, just get out of your seat, up in the balcony, come and join us here. We'll pray and we'll believe God for you and with you. If you don't know Christ, if you've drifted from Christ, follow these that are coming. Now, there's some, maybe many of you here this morning, worried and fretting. Pastor Dave, what do I, what do, I do in the future? If some of these things you're talking about even begin to happen, what do we do? What about my house, my mortgage, all of these things? The Lord comes to us with a message that casting all your care upon him because he cares for you. Can, can you imagine a God who has flung into the cosmos, not just this one uh, world that we're living in, not this one galaxy, but you understand that there are millions and billions of galaxies beyond ours. The, the Hubble uh, telescope has discovered not just uh, billions of, they're talking about billions of universes. Can you imagine? Endless. And a God who can keep all of that in order. Can't he keep our lives in order? My goodness. And, and, and we have preached faith so long. We have toyed with faith. We have imagined. We have faith. We have talked and preached and, and, and tried to test it and all. But folks, that it, it is time. It is time. And the only reason I can think God would have me do this this morning is that you and I get a hold of some life-changing faith that no matter what happens, somehow God will deliver his people. It, and if, if, if we, if, Folks, how do you how do you explain the 16 Korean Presbyterians right now in the hands of the Afghan uh, terror, uh, Taliban? Two have been murdered, and then then we say, well, you know, the fiery furnace and the lion's den—they're all delivered, and God's not appointed us to wrath. Yes, but there's there, there are two, and they're dying one at a time. There are martyrs under the throne of God, multitudes of martyrs crying out that their blood be avenged, F folks. We've got to be honest about it. We've got to be honest. I'm not going to play games with the church of Jesus Christ. You and I have, you and I have to be prepared to die for Jesus if necessary. And we will go through hard times. But if a God can, if a God can keep this world in orbit and there's a whole cosmos moving in their orbits and in their places and can you imagine a God who's named every billions of stars, every multiplied billions of stars, he's named them all. So he sure knows my name. He knows my name and he knows your name. God, help us to believe God and get a song in our trial. Father, in Jesus' name, we fight against doubt and unbelief and this cast down spirit. Lord, help us to face the days ahead with Holy Ghost courage and you are a strong tower and we can run into you and be safe we are safe in Christ pray this prayer with me Lord Jesus give me confidence in the days ahead and I trust in you and help me O oh Lord to cast my cares upon you forgive my sins Lord forgive my unbelief Come by your Holy Spirit. Lift my spirit. Put joy in my heart. And a song in my heart. Of praise and glory to your holy name.
Now let me pray again for Father, sweep over this congregation in the annex, the overflow rooms, into the balcony, and the choir loft, and the pulpit, and this whole house. Sweep over us with the gentle spirit of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, just breathe upon us now as we walk out into the sunlight of this day. Let us realize, Lord, that this is not the sun that we're looking for. We thank you for it. But, oh, Lord, we, we go into a city where you are the sun. You are the brightness of the day. And, Lord, you will wipe away every tear and you will strengthen us. Lord, we anticipate your coming. We anticipate the soon return of Jesus Christ, our Lord, from glory. Holiday. Will you now just thank him for his faithfulness to you? Lord, I thank you. This is the conclusion of the message.